chapter twenty two of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two mrs barnaby appears to the company at the boarding-house in the character of a full-blown lion arrangements are made for increasing her knowledge of the united states by a tour another meeting between mr egerton and miss beauchamp in the balcony there was something in mrs allen barnaby's demeanour as she entered the dining-room supported on the arm of her husband which both attracted the attention of her particular friends among the company assembled there and puzzled them was she ill was she affronted at somebody or something had she received disagreeable tidings from home or was she only very much fatigued all and each of these motives suggested themselves to all those sufficiently interested in this lady to watch her as she entered the room despite the interesting nature of the business already going on at the top of the table where mrs carmichael puffing and wheezing like a fainting steam-engine was sending round by the sable hands of two negro hebes sharply scrutinized portions of a favourite fish the equality or inequality of this nice and difficult distribution was under ordinary circumstances a matter of great moment and nearly of universal interest but now it was only partially so yet it would be difficult to describe precisely what it was in the bearing of mrs allen barnaby which caused this effect she always walked in with a great deal of dignity and so she did now she had always some volant ribbon or floating scarf to attend to and arrange and so she had now she never failed to return with great benignity any salutations which she might receive as she moved onward to her place nor did she fail to do so now but in all this there was something that nobody had ever seen before a blending of condescension and indifference an eye that seemed not fully conscious of the identity of the objects over which it glanced an air of superiority softened by benevolence and finally a look of gentle tenderness when she turned towards her husband that seemed to indicate that she recognized in him a being who in some degree at least approached to an equality of condition with herself having reached the chair now constantly reserved for her next to her friend mrs beauchamp she placed herself in it with a sort of circular bow that seemed to say pray do not disturb yourselves but not even to that favourite lady did she give more than a half smile and a half nod accompanied with a languid look and drooping eyelid that seemed to speak exhaustion and fatigue oh my exclaimed her observant friend if you aren't regularly done up mrs allen barnaby god bless your dear heart you have just been working too hard that's quite plain and clear and that won't do at all we shall have you ill by and by if we don't take care and then what is to come of our delightful tour take my advice and desire your husband the major to send you a glass of his wine though i am sure for the matter of that colonel beauchamp would be first-rate happy to offer you a taste of his only gentlemen boarders are generally supposed to know their own lady's taste best haven't you been writing an unaccountable quantity to-day mrs allen barnaby say mrs allen barnaby in reply to this question turned her benignant countenance upon her friend there was a gentle and very charming smile upon it but the eyes were considerably more than half closed and for a few seconds she suffered herself to be looked at in silence then she said shaking her head and smiling if possible with still more benignity oh no you are quite mistaken dear lady i have not written a single line there was a look of blank disappointment on the countenance of mrs beauchamp on hearing this which recalled mrs allen barnaby to the necessity of not losing any birds already in her hand while starting away to look after others which were still in the bush she therefore so far recalled herself to the passing moment as to say you look surprised my dear mrs beauchamp and so you well may but your surprise would cease if you knew what a morning i had passed not sick i hope returned her new friend with very sincere anxiety i'm sure i wouldn't have you take a spell of sickness just now for more than i'll say you are very kind oh no not sick or sorry i assure you only engaged too incessantly occupied by a multitude of letters to do anything but read them my a mail from the old country i expect replied mrs beauchamp with a sort of congratulatory smile no returned mrs allen barnaby composedly not so all my letters were from ladies and gentlemen mostly from gentlemen indeed who were here last night a visible augmentation of colour suffused the cheeks of mrs beauchamp on hearing these words an effect which was instantly and satisfactorily remarked by the authoress 
they will be at fisticuffs about me soon if i don't take care thought she but it will be better for me to carry on everything peaceably and profit by them all in turn and with this feeling she smiled with more of peculiar and personal affection on mrs beauchamp than she had done before and said i must ask your advice and assistance about all this in a society so particularly select and elegant i would not for the world offend anybody but it is impossible to accept all these invitations and you must help me to decide whom i must refuse what's that about invitations mamma demanded madame tornorino who like the rest of the company had remarked something queer in her mother's looks which now with her inherited shrewdness she thought might very likely be the result of more compliments and invitations i say mamma she resumed i beg you will let me know all the invites in time for i hate to be taken at a hop and so does the don too fear not my love replied her mother with a tranquillizing nod i will always contrive to give you time enough for dressing but upon my word dear i don't think i can promise to keep a regular calendar of all invitations it would occupy more time than i can spare but you may go into my room if you like it after dinner and collect all the notes and letters which you will find lying about upon my table and read them if it will be any satisfaction to you ask if you may bring them all down into the drawing-room whispered miss matilda perkins across don tornorino by whose side it was the pleasure of his young wife that her friend should always sit thinking it probably more cosy and comfortable to keep their party thus far together than to let any other lady sit next him particularly that odious annie beauchamp whom she hated above all things and towards whom she had more than once caught the beautiful eyes of her don directed oh for goodness sake bring them down my darling dearest madame tornorino reiterated her eager friend very well was the reply hold your tongue and say nothing about it i shall bring them down if i like it and ask no leave you may depend upon it i should have thought you might have guessed that without my telling you mrs beauchamp who though for very different reasons was quite as anxious about these invitations as matilda herself ventured to ask a few questions of her new friend respecting the names of the parties from whence they came to all of which mrs allen barnaby replied with almost her former affectionate warmth of manner you shall see them all my dear mrs beauchamp don't imagine for a moment that it is possible i could have any reserves with you oh no we must talk them all over together thank you very much replied the comforted mrs beauchamp i certainly should like to see who comes forward first and foremost i told you how it would be didn't i mrs allen barnaby you won't forget that i expect say no indeed i shall never forget the exceedingly kind and friendly manner in which you have conducted yourself towards me throughout my dear madam i shall not easily meet with any one whose society i shall enjoy so thoroughly as i do yours there was some comfort in hearing this but the words did not seem to mean exactly what the same words would have meant yesterday at least so thought or rather so felt mrs beauchamp but yet to do her justice she did by no means fully enter into or understand the nature of the change she remarked she thought indeed that it was likely enough mrs allen barnaby might like to listen to other first-rate patriotic ladies as well as to her and might wish to compare testimonies together in order to get at the exact truth but for all the calculations which were going on as to whom she could turn to greatest profit in other ways nothing of the kind ever entered her head neither did she long suffer the trifling difference which she had fancied perceptible in the illustrious lady's tone to dwell upon her mind i ought to be ashamed of myself thought she the moment afterwards for having any such fancies as if we ought not one and all to think of the one great object of having justice done to our country and there is no danger upon that score as long as this dear writing lady keeps clear of those wicked and rebellious free states that don't scruple to abuse our venerable institutions about slavery just as bad more shame for them as our foreign enemies themselves can do so the next time mrs allen barnaby gave her an opportunity of speaking to her again which was not immediately for to say truth that lady had in a great degree lost the comfort she might have found from mrs carmichael's dinners in consequence of the immense importance she had hitherto attached to all that was said to her and was now making amends to herself for it by attending much more to the dinner and much less to the conversation than heretofore but as soon as she found an opportunity mrs beauchamp said do you happen mrs allen barnaby ma'am to recollect any of the names of the gentlemen who have been writing to you i can't say but what i should like to know who's come forward 
mrs allen barnaby who had just completed the demolition of a very savoury plate and had been reflecting during the pleasant process on the various words and phrases which had reached her since her arrival at new orleans relative to the first rateness of standing of her already well secured friend mrs colonel beauchamp promptly replied and in accents of perfectly recovered cordiality my dearest friend i have the very worst head in the world for names let me see let me see oh yes my dear mrs beauchamp there is one i remember perfectly and the better perhaps because i received two notes so signed gregory is the name both general gregory and mrs gregory wrote most obligingly and very strongly urged our immediately paying them a visit at their place in the country possible exclaimed mrs colonel beauchamp and there stopped possible repeated mrs allen barnaby what does that mean my dear friend do you doubt its being possible oh my no mrs allen barnaby no doubt of anything you say could enter my thoughts you may be very sure only to me who so well know the general and his uncommon quietness upon all matters leaving everything to his wife you know and all that it does seem something like a miracle that he should sit down and write an invitation specially as his lady was doing the very same it certainly shows a most amiable and cordial feeling of hospitality replied mrs allen barnaby so much so indeed that i felt the moment i read their two letters that it would be quite impossible to refuse the invitation but i do hope and trust my dear lady returned the now really terrified mrs beauchamp that nothing and nobody will be able to lead you aside from the plan we have so beautifully laid down together for the examination of all the most important parts of the union say no dearest mrs colonel beauchamp responded the authoress most truly may you affirm both to yourself and others that nothing will induce me to abandon a project to which my heart and my understanding are alike pledged alike wedded alike bound this was uttered with solemnity the movement of the knife and fork being intermitted and the raised eyes fixed devoutly on the ceiling thank god ejaculated mrs colonel beauchamp fervently then i don't care how many bean for earthly man woman or child that tour can't be done every day from july to eternity and it is i that shall be as i must say i ought my dear mrs allen barnaby your companion and leader to edify you as to where you should look first and foremost mrs allen barnaby assiduously fed herself upon duck and green corn and smiled and nodded an affectionate assent it is probable that the whole party at the boarding-table had heard enough of what had passed there to feel some curiosity as to what was to be brought down and accordingly the cigar-smoking which usually takes place at that hour in the chambers the wives of american citizens being imperturbably amiable on this point was postponed and the whole party assembled in the saloon patty failed not to do as she had declared she would do if it so pleased her and as it did please her to scamper into her mamma's room the moment the party had risen from the table and to scamper down again as fast as she could run with both her hands full of letters and a few for fun secured beneath her chin she reached the saloon just as the last of the company entered it and bouncing up to the longest table bent over it and discharged the three divisions of her load at the same moment there she exclaimed now then let's see what it's all about that dear creature's vivacity will never be restrained let the business in hand be ever so important observed her mother moving with a very slow and deliberate pace towards the table mrs allen barnaby was in truth in no great hurry to reach it for not only the ardent eager-minded miss matilda perkins was already bending over the still open despatches and possessing herself of their contents with the most assiduous industry but very many others of the party were doing exactly the same thing without the slightest shadow of restraint or ceremony and as the lady to whom they were addressed happened to prefer their being read by all the world she had no wish to cheek the operation by her presence but mrs allen barnaby showed her english ignorance in thus restraining her steps nothing short of her withdrawing her letters altogether or so folding them up that no portion of their contents could be seen would have sufficed to check it the lively patty however either from consideration for those who could not find room to place themselves where they could read the various pages thus displayed or else because she thought it a capital joke to show off to all the set at once how much they were in fashion began reading them aloud with great distinctness and certainly much to the satisfaction of all who listened to her oh what a madcap cried mrs allen barnaby dropping into a chair before she had reached even the outskirts of the throng that was pressing round her daughter 
is not madame tornorino a saucy creature louisa this was addressed to the greatly improved and almost gay miss perkins who really seemed to be inspired with new life by the gentle kindness of annie beauchamp the unceasing good humour of mr egerton and more still oh infinitely more by the very marked attentions which she saw her dear matilda receiving from all the american gentlemen who approached her to this appeal of mrs allen barnaby she replied in an accent that really seemed almost fearless there does not seem to be much change in her certainly ma'am but what miss louisa perkins said at that moment was of little consequence the o's the my's the possibles that she heard from the party round the table as patty proceeded in her lecture was so exactly everything that mrs allen barnaby desired that she attended to nothing else she caught the eye of the major who had seated himself at no great distance from her just as patty was pompously giving forth the profound admiration and respect of some general colonel or major followed by the most pressing invitation to his mansion for as many weeks or months as it would be convenient for the admirable authoress and her party to remain and the look that was exchanged between them showed their feelings to be in the most perfect conjugal harmony i am delighted madam said mrs beauchamp when patty had concluded her self-imposed task i am first-rate delighted to find that so many of the very highest standing among our gentlemen and ladies appear to be availed of the obligations they are likely to owe you and i can't enough be thankful to myself for having lost no time in making that fact generally known to all i am sure you are all excessively kind returned mrs allen barnaby arranging her heavy gilt bracelets with rather an absent air i perfectly delight in the country and its charming inhabitants wife whispered the major in her ear as he passed by to leave the room come upstairs i want to speak to you and mrs allen barnaby really wanted to speak to him so permitting him with her usual tact to disappear before she rose to follow him she extended her hand to mrs beauchamp with the full recollection of all she had heard of that lady's reputed wealth and station and said not quite in a whisper oh my dear friend though of course exceedingly gratified by all this depend upon it i can never feel for any other person charming as they all are what i feel for you it is quite impossible i ever should what a fine thing is fame and must not mr john milton have been in some degree mistaken when he declared it to be no plant that grows on mortal soil mrs allen barnaby was unquestionably still in the flesh and yet she had not only found this plant growing in the most delightful abundance in louisiana but discovered that it was easily convertible to all manner of domestic purposes from a pot herb to a garland for the brow nay had she at that moment poured several handfuls of dollars in the lap of mrs colonel beauchamp that lady could not have considered it more completely satisfactory payment for all she had done and all that she meant to do for the honour glory profit and convenience of mrs allen barnaby than did those few words from her in return for mrs allen barnaby had not only acquired fame but she knew it and had skill enough at once to bring it into current use as a sort of bill of exchange which as long as her credit lasted would pass very well in payment for most things in a country so exceedingly fond of celebrity and renown as the united states of america on reaching her room mrs allen barnaby found her husband already there and waiting for her rather impatiently my dear he began i won't waste any time complimenting you upon the capital manner in which you have set all these funny folks spinning but i see it all i promise you and i admire your cleverness accordingly what you and i must talk about my dear is not how all this has been brought about but how we can best turn it to account that's quite true donny she replied with a decisive nod that spoke as plainly as any words could have done how completely she agreed with him don't fancy that i mean to content myself by being blown up by all these famous fine words not a bit of it i promise you i don't see any good reason whatever why we should not travel about from house to house as long as the fancy holds them living upon the fat of the land as we shall be sure to do major and paying nothing for it but just scribbling and sputtering a little puff 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 as we go along shan't we progress like a steam-engine the major clapped his hands and laughed aloud by jove my barnaby he cried i think i am more heartily in love with you than ever i was in my life and i don't believe you've got your equal in the old world or the new either to be sure my love that's what we'll do it is exactly the very thing that came into my head as patty was reading 
and it will be perhaps a better speed than even your quick wit is quite aware of of course i am not quite idle on my side i am sure it would be a shame if i was and you working away as you do and i have found out a thing or two about these rich planter people you my dear have got hold of their stale passion as i may call it or rather of their two staple passions that is to say their vanity about their country and their greatness and their red-hot terror of losing hold of their slaves now you'll keep on working em on this side while i'll keep on playing em deary upon another i find that there isn't scarcely one of these rich slave-holding chaps who make their niggers wait upon them up and down from morning to night so that they do little or nothing but eat drink sleep and spit for themselves i am told that there isn't scarcely one of em who doesn't more or less try to keep themselves awake by play now can you fancy anything my dear falling out much better than that we shall have to write a letter of thanks wife upon my soul we shall to those precious relations of yours that played bo peep behind the curtain we shall be living upon roses here i see it as plain as the handsome nose in your face my barnaby for you may just remember if you please that credit doesn't hold out for ever even in london and with a fine house and a fine wife like you to back it christmas would have been sure to come mrs allen barnaby and a few little bills my dear would have been sure to come with it whereas in this blessed land it seems exceedingly probable i think that we shall make money and spend none exactly so replied his wife bowing to him that mr major is precisely the scheme i have conceived for us during the next four or five months perhaps and then if my work is completed and i get paid for it in hard cash as these people say i shall be we may then venture i think to take a house of our own i should like it to be in the capital donny if they would but make up their minds as to where that is but it seems hard to find any two of em that agree upon that point never mind that my dear returned the major laughing when we do settle down we will take care to fix upon just whatever we think pleasantest and if we go on as we expect to do we shall be able to pick and choose as we like but now my dear let us come to business to which of all these people will it be best to go first to the beauchamps donny stick to the beauchamps my dear in the first instance it will look best a great deal because of all the fuss i have been making about my love and affection and admiration and gratitude and all the rest of it besides they certainly are very rich he is an inveterate card-player in a sober way and that she knows how to set a thing going we have had capital good proof of already so i say stick to the beauchamps at first but then you must please to observe that i don't mean to go gallivanting in a steamboat all down these everlasting rivers that they talk about for i suppose it is a matter of course that we should be expected to pay our own expenses on board and just think what that would come to with patty and her don upon our hands whereas you'll observe that when we get to their elegant big gang bank that they all talk about there will be an end of paying except indeed that if the perkinses really get in there too i shall expect that they will make us some consideration for it they need not pay us quite as much as they would at a boarding-house you know but they can't expect we should drag them about for nothing my dear love replied the major your notions on every point are so clear so clever so quick in short so admirable in every way that i should be a great deal worse than a fool if i attempted to check or control you on any subject of business whatever anything of that kind with the perkinses i should leave entirely to you in fact to say the honest truth i don't feel that i have tact and skill enough to do anything of the sort myself but i give you carte blanche my dear very well major returned the lady laughing i understand perfectly you would like to get the dollars but you would not like the asking for them but never mind my dear i'll undertake all that provided you don't object to my using your name a little i really must do that major or i should not be able to make the thing look right and reasonable as i should certainly wish to do as you please my love my name is your own you know so of course you may use it as you like and luckily they are both so devilish ugly that i can't say i care much what you say but now then as to the time and manner of our starting what do you mean to say to your dear friend in reply to this question mrs allen barnaby entered at some length into an explanation of her views and as the result will show what these were we may leave the conjugal consultation uninterrupted annie beauchamp had left the saloon by her usual point of escape the window as soon as madame tornorino commenced the reading aloud of her mamma's letters 
for to say truth there was something in the manner and bearing of this english beauty which very particularly irritated the nerves of the young american nobody however followed her example for no single individual present except herself seemed without some feeling of curiosity as to the contents of the despatches that madame tornorino was thus making public even mr egerton though hitherto he had not displayed any very strong feeling of interest in the immediate concerns of major and mrs allen barnaby was now evidently listening with the rest of the company to these flattering testimonials of louisianian and carolinian esteem nor did his attention to the voice of the fair reader relax till she had in loud and distinct tones gone through the perusal of every document but upon patty's throwing down the last sheet and exclaiming there that's all he immediately walked up to miss louisa perkins and offering his arm said do you not think miss perkins that we should find the air of the balcony very refreshing for half a moment the kind-hearted louisa paused to consider whether there were any possible means by which she could transfer this honour to her sister but perceiving on turning her eyes round to look for her that she was in earnest conversation with mr horatio timpsackle she smiled a ready assent to the agreeable proposal and taking the young man's offered arm walked through the same window at which annie beauchamp had disappeared that young lady whom for a few minutes miss louisa had really forgotten was seated on her favourite bench beneath the orange tree with her eyes fixed in rather a vacant glance upon another orange tree immediately opposite to her oh dear me there's that nice young lady all by herself exclaimed miss louisa using a little gentle influence upon the arm of her companion in order to lead his steps towards her and how long have you been here all alone my dear she continued addressing the solitary beauty with an affectionate smile i thought we were all in the great room together listening to miss patty bawling out those surprisingly kind letters that have been addressed to her mamma i will not deny that i for one was rather curious to hear them but yet i think if i had known that you were sitting quietly here by yourself i should have been apt to leave miss patty and the letters for the pleasure of hearing you talk a little annie smiled in return to this speech but not very gaily and moving to the end of the bench made room for miss louisa to sit beside her mr egerton looked a little uncertain what to do but after the hesitation of a moment he took advantage of miss louisa's evident intention to leave space sufficient for him also and sat himself down beside her as neither of her companions seemed at all inclined to converse miss perkins seemed to think it incumbent on her to talk a little herself and began accordingly i can't help thinking miss beauchamp she said that the ladies and gentlemen of your country must be the kindest and most hospitable people in the world i could not have believed it possible that we should all of us have received such a quite wonderful number of invitations and not one of us knowing a single soul in the whole country only a few days ago almost as one may say i am sure mrs o mrs allen barnaby i mean has good reason to praise the country and all the people in it if she is really going to write a book for i certainly think that they are kinder and more hospitable than any nation i ever heard of in all my life before and i shall always say so though i shan't write it this was a very long speech for miss louisa perkins to make but still it did not produce the effect she desired by making her companions talk too for neither of them spoke a single word mr egerton might have been seen however if any one had happened to look at him stealing a glance across his neighbour at the beautiful young face beyond her perhaps the owner of that beautiful young face was aware of it for the delicately pale cheek blushed deeply and seemed to send its bright reflection even to the brow and neck but the head was instantly turned away and the curious young englishman had no opportunity at that moment of criticising its american contour your sister is trying i think to catch your eye miss perkins said mr egerton and if i am not mistaken she wants you to go to her dear me you don't say so said miss louisa hastily starting up and hurrying away and yet i wonder too considering but she moved so quickly that she was out of hearing and within the window before she could finish the sentence the young lady who had been stationed on the other side of her had so completely turned herself away leaning over the arm of the bench which they occupied that she did not appear immediately to perceive her departure miss beauchamp said mr egerton gently so gently indeed that it was extraordinary his voice should have made her start as it did miss beauchamp said he i have a proposal i mean that i have a bargain to propose to you will you listen to it the american young lady started a little at hearing these words and upon looking round and finding herself tete-a-tete -tete with the english young gentleman who spoke them half rose from her seat with the intention of walking away 
but the second thought which prevented her doing this not only came quickly but decidedly and it was with an air of being very particularly determined to hear him and to answer him too that she turned herself round and said yes sir i am quite willing to listen to you frederick egerton would perhaps have been less disconcerted if she had answered less complyingly but marvelling at his own folly in feeling thus he rallied and proceeded pretty nearly in the terms he had intended that is very obliging he said and i will not detain you very long what i wish to propose miss beauchamp is this let us mutually agree not definitely to form any opinion of each other's country and countrymen and countrywomen he added with a smile till we are fairly enabled to do so by having rather more general information on the subject than we either of us possess at present annie eyed him almost steadily for about a second and then blushed a good deal for having done so but she too rallied quickly and replied perhaps sir it would be more like good christians and reasonable human beings if we did so but if we make this agreement he resumed with a smile which had no very malicious expression in it and which certainly made him look very handsome if we make this agreement miss beauchamp we must do it fairly on both sides must we not i mean that we must not scruple to confess to each other the observations either favourable or unfavourable which we may chance to make this is necessary to truth and justice is it not either in the words themselves or in his manner of speaking them there was something that made annie blush again but this emotion however caused seemed to make her angry either with herself or with him for she knit her beautiful brows as she replied if you wish me to confess that i entirely disapprove and condemn the line of conduct adopted by some of the gentlemen and ladies of new orleans towards some of the gentlemen and ladies of england as witnessed both by yourself and me sir during the last few days i am quite ready to gratify you i do disapprove and condemn it greatly perhaps you mean said egerton colouring a little in his turn perhaps you mean miss beauchamp that you disapprove and condemn any and every hospitality or kindness of any sort offered from the inhabitants of your country towards the inhabitants of mine no she replied but in an altered and less haughty tone no i mean not that i mean that i am sorry and ashamed to perceive that even the admirable judgment and good sense of americans can be blinded and rendered useless by by their prejudices egerton perceived that he had touched a string which vibrated too strongly for pique or pettishness to affect the tone which it produced he longed to speak to the beautiful and intelligent-looking young creature before him with more of candour and common sense than he had yet done but felt strangely at a loss how to begin he was perplexed not only by his own embarrassment but by seeking to comprehend why he felt it was he afraid of miss annie beauchamp absurd idea he rejected it indignantly and mastering the sort of shyness which had checked him he said more seriously and perhaps too with more punctilious respect than he had ever before used in addressing her may i venture miss beauchamp to believe that in using the word prejudice on the subject to which i think you allude your opinions respecting it are at all like what you suppose mine to be i would rather have avoided all conversation with you on such a topic sir replied annie after meditating for a moment but yet i believe that i have no right to think you mean to pain me by speaking on it nobody i believe supposes that any inhabitant of a slave state can see anything to lament in the laws which exist in it this is not a very fair judgment but it is idle to complain of it for it is only a part of the injustice that is done us there are many among us who judge you i mean your country more fairly mr egerton all americans as you would find if you knew more individuals among them all americans do not suppose that all englishmen approve the atrocities practised upon children in your manufacturing districts nor would they think it right to take it for granted that you all approve the regulations now enforced by your poor laws egerton listened to her with great attention and certainly with great astonishment also her words and manner produced moreover another feeling but this related rather to himself than to her he began to suspect that he had been guilty of injustice that he had formed his opinions hastily and without sufficient grounds or at any rate that he had not allowed enough for individual exceptions and with the candour which such self-condemnation was likely to produce he replied i believe you are very right miss beauchamp i believe that we english do all of us form opinions and pronounce them too a great deal too much upon general views without seeking as we ought to do for exceptions that might lead to modify them your words have suggested this very useful truth and i shall not forget them 
but you will allow i am sure that in order to make this productive of all the good of which it is capable it is necessary that we should occasionally meet with good sense and candour equal to your own and that all our attempts to become acquainted with your widely extended and important country should not be always and for ever met with the broad assertion that it is the best and wisest in the world this is a species of information which it is impossible to receive in the sort of wholesale manner in which it is given and it is often rejected en masse because offered en masse these words produced on the mind of annie beauchamp an effect exceedingly like what hers had produced on that of frederick egerton that is to say she felt there might be some truth in them and the coincidence made her blush again but she smiled too and in such a sort that the young englishman not only thought her a thousand times handsomer than ever but he thought also and very nearly independent of any such consideration that he should greatly like to converse further with her now that so much of the prejudice which had mutually influenced them seemed in so fair a way of being lessened at least if not altogether removed but exactly at this moment and before frederick had advanced further than gently smiling in return miss louisa perkins came back again through the window exclaiming oh dear me you are quite mistaken in fancying my sister wanted me my dear young gentleman for instead of that i believe between you and i she would a good deal rather that i just stayed away it was some time after i went in before i could see at all for you know they make the room so dark with blinds but when i did find her at last i saw in a minute that i had better keep away for she was talking with another person so very earnestly that they neither of them seemed as if they wanted any more company this was all said in a manner so unusually lively and with such an air of extreme satisfaction that it seemed as if her return to the balcony was particularly agreeable to her feelings miss beauchamp again made room for her beside herself but whether she was quite as much delighted at this renewed arrangement as miss louisa may be doubted as to egerton he did not seem at all disposed to leave the matter in any doubt as far as he was concerned himself for without attempting to utter a word in reply to miss perkins's information he started from his place and passing hastily through the saloon left the house End of chapter twenty two chapters twenty three and twenty four of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty three conversation and consultation between the ladies of the major and the colonel a curious idea respecting the best manner of making visiting answer another large party of which mrs allen barnaby was again very decidedly the heroine concluded the day and it was not till the following morning that any opportunity occurred for her to converse with her still more highly favoured friend mrs colonel beauchamp upon the important subject of their approaching departure a very considerable change had taken place in the former lady's state of mind since the subject had been last canvassed between them and though in point of time this interval had not exceeded three days whole years sometimes pass over us without producing an equally decisive effect there was as the reader may by this time be pretty tolerably well aware a good deal of native decisiveness of purpose in the character of mrs allen barnaby and when she had determined upon doing anything she generally did it but notwithstanding this strong propensity to having her own way the admirable fund of good sense which she possessed prevented that way for the most part from leading her astray from her interest and therefore in all former conversations with mrs beauchamp upon the subject of the plans they were to pursue together she had hardly felt conscious of having any wish or will except that of ingratiating herself still further in the favour of that lady and promoting everything that could lead to increasing their intercourse and intimacy but now matters were altogether changed and their mutual position pretty nearly reversed mrs allen barnaby felt all over that it was she who was the person to confer honour and mrs colonel beauchamp the person to receive it in her opinion therefore it followed naturally that for the future that lady's wishes and convenience were on all points to give way to her own and though quite determined not to permit either will or whim no not even her own to deprive her of the solid advantages which she intended to reap from the devoted attachment of the wealthy planter's lady her mode of addressing her when they were next tete-a-tete -tete, approached very nearly in spirit to the celebrated tis mine to speak and thine to hear of the romance nor was she at all mistaken in the calculation she had made respecting the degree in which this was likely to be endured without producing any disagreeable result whatever 
perhaps mrs colonel beauchamp was a little surprised to hear that her dear friend had given up all thoughts of the delightful steamboat excursion they were all to make together but as to anger no such feeling ever entered her head and still less her heart and her first words were after becoming thoroughly availed as she would have said of the change which had taken place in mrs allen barnaby's intentions then you don't think i expect that you should be able to fix yourself for another long journey so soon i don't think i shall set off upon another long journey so soon returned the authoress slightly smiling but not from any fear of fatigue or over-exertion where the mind is forcibly sustained mrs beauchamp the body rarely gives way no my reasons for this alteration are wholly distinct from any idea of mere personal pleasure or personal inconvenience from you my dear madam i have no reserves nor do i wish to have any the generous the truly liberal hospitality with which you have invited myself and the whole of my suite to your big house at big bang bank can never be remembered without a feeling of gratified and let me say grateful affection i mean i fully mean to accept this hospitality and to repose with my important manuscript before me under the shadow of your friendly sugar-canes well knowing that i can in no way so well prove to you how thoroughly i appreciate your kindness as by accepting it and there i am sure you are quite right my dearest lady replied the really delighted mrs beauchamp there is nothing that i know of that would be so always agreeable to me as that and to my husband the colonel i expect as much as to me for in course i calculate upon your husband the major not forgetting his card-playing because he is in the country he is too smart a gentleman for that i expect oh no there is not the slightest fear of it i am sure returned mrs allen barnaby with an encouraging nod the major is really one of the most amiable men in the world and would rather i am convinced play every night of his life to amuse and please so excellent a person as the colonel than follow any more favourite pursuit of his own and to make you quite easy on that head i can assure you that he really does not dislike cards at all himself all men of fashion with us you know are accustomed to play and rather high too even from their earliest childhood and this of course becomes habitual to them so that scarcely any of our really distinguished men ever like to go to bed till they have passed their accustomed hour or two at play so do not let that worry you dear mrs beauchamp it will all do very well i dare say the major as you may naturally suppose has been accustomed to have his attention roused and kept awake by a tolerably high stake all men of fortune are used to that i presume in every country but there is no danger that our gentlemen should differ about that point and in short i look forward to enjoying a long visit to you exceedingly mrs beauchamp who had already began running over in her mind the different people to whom she could show off her illustrious guest replied with the most cordial earnestness assuring her that there was nothing the colonel would not feel ready and bound to do in order to show his respect and gratitude for the admirable elegant expressions respecting the slave business which mrs allen barnaby had read up to them on that point replied our authoress with a good deal of solemnity on that point i shall have much more to say i consider it in fact one of such prodigious importance to this whole country that i am almost tempted to believe i should make my work of higher utility by devoting my pages wholly to the slave states than by mixing up in it any observations concerning that portion of the union from whence slavery has been so unwisely banished my general admiration for the whole country and for all the truly superior people who inhabit it would render it extremely disagreeable to me of course were i to feel myself obliged to blame the principles and conduct of any portion of them and yet my dear madam how could i help pointing the finger of reprobation against those who actually threaten as one of the gentlemen so well observed the other night to revolutionize this magnificent and unequalled country by abolishing slavery mrs colonel beauchamp was in ecstasies while listening to this speech and really seemed to restrain herself with difficulty from falling at the feet of the speaker oh my she exclaimed while tears of emotion trembled on her eyelids i expect that you do understand the nature of the union better than any gentleman or lady that ever visited it before yes my dear lady you are quite right 
there is not one of us could bear or abide your speaking any way disrespectful of any part of our glorious and immortal country and therefore as you most elegantly observe it will be far better and preferable a hundred thousand times over that you should write wholly and solely upon the great blessings and advantages of slavery instead of turning away from our quite perfect state just to belittle the others pray god you may keep in the same mind about that my dear mrs allen barnaby and then i shall be only just too happy that's all yes dear lady that is my view of the case exactly and if we can but contrive to keep the good major and the rest of our party tolerably well contented and amused in the south and west i really do not see any reason for our travelling north and east just to find what is rather less perfect oh my yes dearest mrs allen barnaby that is exactly hitting it off to a nicety rather less perfect that's just the fact rather less perfect repeated the patriotic mrs beauchamp infinitely relieved by finding that nothing which had been said upon slavery which was of course the subject nearest to their warm southern hearts had produced any very greatly reduced estimate of the general perfection of the union as a whole on the mind of the enlightened traveller there is one other point my dear mrs beauchamp in which i must say a word or two resumed mrs allen barnaby with an affectionate smile you must promise not to think that my bringing all my party with me is any mark of ostentation of course you know that with us an author of any celebrity is considered as paying the very highest compliment possible by bringing friends with him to any house where he may be invited it is always considered as a proof that he looks upon the family he visits as worthy to become a part of his own chosen circle and this feeling indeed is carried so far that i have known every one of a party of ten who accompanied one of our favourite writers to a nobleman's place in the country desired to give their autographs which were accordingly inscribed in the album of the duchess the duchess yes i am pretty sure it was the duchess my own favourite duchess who is always so kind to me i just mention this circumstance my dear mrs beauchamp to show that in bringing my party with me i am paying you the greatest compliment i have in my power to bestow and i wish you to be aware my dear friend that this is my reason for doing it and not any foolish feeling of ostentation i hope you understand this i do my dearest lady most perfectly and entirely replied mrs beauchamp warmly i feel all your goodness and kindness to me and my country and nothing shall be wanting that i can do to make big gang bank agreeable to you only dear dear lady let me entreat you not to be running away in a hurry it is a great wide town of a place as you will see and there will be room enough for you and your friends and a heap of folks besides if you should like more company and that my dear lady is one of the blessed advantages of having a gang of slaves at command it is likely enough that if you travelled eastward to philadelphia and boston and new york or to any of the unfortunate free states you would find that noble-minded as all the people are on account of their being americans they would be so fretted and troubled about where to get help that ten to one they would not be able to invite you to their houses so many at a time as we can do poor things is it possible that their foolish prejudices keep them in so degraded a condition it is really pitiable returned mrs allen barnaby adding with great sincerity i really doubt if under all the circumstances notwithstanding my reverence for them as americans i really very much doubt if i should find everything there as completely to my taste as i do here mrs beauchamp again applauded the admirable good sense and discrimination of her friend and they parted after its having been made perfectly well understood that the time of their setting off together for big gang bank was to be entirely regulated by the pleasure and convenience of mrs allen barnaby our provident and thoughtful heroine had already written very eloquent amiable and satisfactory letters to all her new orleans correspondents in reply to their invitations and she now stood with a list in her hand of the names and the places her promised visits to which were likely to maintain the whole party at free quarters for at least six months to come bravo she exclaimed aloud to her heart and now for a little visit to the dear good perkinses 
she found the two sisters in a very comfortable state of mind and by the help of a little ingenuity in a more comfortable state of body too than could have been expected considering the usual temperature of the quarters that had been assigned them their bedroom was indeed almost intolerably small and intolerably hot but the good-natured cleopatra hinted to them that nobody ever came into the wide sort of corridor upon which their attic apartment opened and which as is usual in most houses in that region stretched the whole length of the house except to look for boxes and trunks that being the great receptacle for all such articles after receiving this hint which was made intelligible by sundry grimaces indicating the possibility of putting forth from their crowded room a table and chairs the sisters ventured without any more special permission to establish themselves there during the performance of all the needful stitchery which little wardrobes require and though its vicinity to the roof gave it rather a fearful resemblance to the piombi of venice it had a strong current of air passing through it and they both agreed in thinking it better to sneeze than to be stifled here it was then that with thimble and scissors and pincushion and wire and remnants of lace and well smoothed knots of ribbon the fair matilda fabricated caps and tuckers to her heart's content while her willing well-pleased sister sat opposite to her darning the stockings of both had they been discovered so employed a few short days before the scene would have had quite a different aspect for miss matilda might probably have been groaning under the necessity of decorating a head and bosom that appeared of value to no one but herself and even the more gentle-tempered louisa if not equally bitter and fretful in her misery might have been looking very nearly as sad from her dread lest the solemn promise she had received from her sister might not avail to preserve her from the self-destruction to which the utter indifference of all the american gentlemen they had yet seen seemed but too directly to lead but now the aspect of everything was changed matilda was actually talking to her sister and laughing while the happy louisa instead of dreading what she might hear her say next sat listening and darning and darning and listening with the most comfortable air imaginable and not without hope perhaps that among the many pretty speeches repeated to her as having been uttered by sundry unmarried american gentlemen she might hear something that sounded really promising so girls began the panting mrs allen barnaby as she approached them you are high enough to be sure at the very tip-top of all things but when one does get here it is fresh and pleasant enough get a chair for me louisa that's a good soul and then upon the gentle spinster's running off to obey her she dropped into that which she had left fanning herself with the delightful vegetable fan of new orleans which she rarely put out of her hand except when asleep and turning her ample person in all directions to catch the current of air she exclaimed upon my word you have managed well ladies i'll be hanged if i have felt any place so cool since i've been in this stove of a town oh dear me i'm glad you like it replied the kind louisa assiduously arranging a ragged footstool for her accommodation and without in the least intending to be ironical as some might have fancied could they have felt the atmosphere that was thus applauded i do believe it is not much hotter here in the garrets than it is down below hotter louisa i tell you it's twenty times cooler than our room but i do believe you two are very sharp and clever in looking after your own comforts and that's one reason why i think you will be pleased at hearing what i am come to say to you now the sisters were all attention and mrs allen barnaby proceeded there is no need i suppose for me to tell you girls that i am got already to be all the fashion at new orleans i suppose you have found that out for yourselves i think so indeed my dearest friend and no wonder returned matilda and yes indeed ma'am tis quite plain as you say chimed in louisa well then i hope you will be ready to allow that i am notwithstanding all that the same good kind friend you have ever found me when i tell you that one of my first thoughts has been how to make you to share in the advantages which all this fashion and admiration brings with it oh my dearest my most adored friend exclaimed the enthusiastic miss matilda clasping her hands and fully persuaded that they were to be taken upon some exceedingly gay visit listen to me quietly matilda my dear and you will see that it is not only your pleasure but your real interest i have got in view exclaimed mrs allen barnaby gravely you know what you pay for your board here and i am told that in many places it is much dearer still and it has therefore come into my head and into that of the dear good major too that we may be able by a little painstaking and some few sacrifices perhaps on our parts we may be able i say 
if you will pay to us just two-thirds of what you do here to get you hooked in for visitings that may last for months to come and that too in the midst of the very best company and with plenty of gentlemen about us matilda into the bargain what do you say to that my dears now it is quite certain that after the public reading of mrs barnaby's letters which naturally enough the sisters had listened to very attentively they had conceived hopes not only that they should be included in the invitations for that was a matter not of hope but of certainty inasmuch as they had heard that they were so included with their own watchful ears but that the scanty purse which supplied their wants would be very greatly relieved thereby and that the nine dollars which they now paid every week for their boarding might be converted while these visits were in course to other very much needed purposes it was therefore rather a blank look that was exchanged between them on first hearing mrs allen barnaby's generous proposal but happily for their peace and prosperity they both knew her a great deal too well to venture anything in the slightest degree approaching to a remonstrance and matilda being quicker than her sister and feeling perhaps less difficulty in uttering protestations of gratitude more expected than felt broke forth just in time into a volley of thanks which sufficed to keep everything smooth and not only to ensure them the visits and the mitigated expense but to spare them the very disagreeable assurance that they might just take themselves off and shift for themselves as soon as they pleased and what do you think of the scheme miss louisa demanded their patroness turning short round upon that quiet lady with a good deal of energy both of look and voice i shall think it a very nice scheme mrs o mrs allen barnaby if it won't be making ourselves too troublesome to you replied the meek spinster blushing a little oh very well then that business is settled and you may get ready to pack yourselves up pretty quickly for i don't mean to stay in this horrid hot place many days longer i promise you and then hinting that though the corridor was the coolest place in the house the two miss perkinses somehow or other contrived to make it hot by sitting there she got up nodded a farewell and departed chapter twenty four mr egerton makes a little discovery but is rather puzzled as to what use he ought to make of it his intimacy with miss louisa increases prodigiously it happened in the course of the following two or three days all of which were very fully occupied in paying and receiving visits by the allen barnaby party that mr egerton found himself standing one evening quite accidentally behind major allen barnaby while that gentleman was engaged at ecarte at a tolerably high stake in one of the most fashionable drawing-rooms of new orleans being behind the major it followed of course from the established habits of the two affectionately attached individuals that he was opposite to his elegant son-in-law don tornorino who never failed to be so placed when his respected father-in-law amused himself by playing at cards frederick egerton himself was no great card-player and knew as little or rather less perhaps about it than most people nevertheless he had not remained very long in this position before he saw or fancied that he saw certain looks of intelligence steal from beneath the heavy black eyelashes of the don towards the major of course the moment he conceived this idea he naturally began to observe more closely but the doing so did not greatly assist him in positively ascertaining whether the fact were so or not if it were it was impossible to refuse to patty's darling all the credit that could possibly belong to a most dexterously skilful performance of the task for if at one moment the glance of his eye evidently fell direct upon the major it wandered so idly the next here there and everywhere that it was almost impossible to suppose him engaged in any occupation loyal or disloyal that demanded attention in this manner egerton was kept in a state of great uncertainty respecting the fact of collusion or no collusion between the parties upon whom accident had thus made him a spy and for a longer space than it is usual for a loiterer to remain in any one place but at length one of the young ladies of the family invited him to listen to a song about to be sung in the next room and he was then obliged to depart without having at all satisfied his mind one way or the other though there is something rather irritating to curiosity in such a doubt as this frederick egerton cared too little about any of the parties to have kept it long in his remembrance had not other circumstances occurred to revive it there why mr frederick egerton was still at new orleans he would himself have found it extremely difficult to say but though his laundress had been punctual in the most exemplary degree and though cleopatra had obeyed all the commands intended to accelerate his departure with the most scrupulous exactness there he was still and probably quite as unable to give any satisfactory answer to a question respecting his future as to a question respecting his past movements 
for some reason or other it might be on account of his handsome person and pleasing address mr egerton had been invited to all the parties that were going on and as at this particular moment everything english seemed the rage at new orleans thanks to the charming mrs allen barnaby he had been told by several of the country gentlemen whose houses were about to be opened to the authoress that his company at the same time would be considered as a very agreeable addition to the english circle his answer to all these civilities had uniformly been that he doubted whether he should be still in the country but that it would give him great pleasure that he was exceedingly obliged and so forth when it happened however that a similar invitation was given him by colonel beauchamp and very civilly seconded by his wife his reply was not so ready considering his intense aversion to mrs allen barnaby her husband daughter her daughter's husband and her friend miss matilda and considering that he perfectly well knew that they were all to be of the party it seems strange that he should have felt any hesitation about giving a decided refusal to such an invitation the very moment he received it on the contrary however though he certainly coloured a little which looked as if he felt somewhat embarrassed by the invitation he replied very distinctly that he should have great pleasure in waiting upon them this invitation had been given and accepted before the evening on which a suspicion of unfair play on the part of the major had arisen in the mind of mr egerton had it been otherwise it is possible that a natural distaste to being thrown into the society of any one of whom it was possible to conceive such an idea might have caused him to give a different answer but as matters now stood the young englishman felt more disposed to protect the hospitable american planter than to turn away from him and as a first step towards doing so determined to have a little conversation with annie's pale protege louisa for the purpose if possible of learning something concerning the position held by the barnaby family at home not indeed that he wanted the gentle spinster's evidence to convince him that the father mother and daughter were not as perhaps he would have phrased it de nous autres nor that the son-in-law was not a true-blooded hidalgo nor that his friend louisa herself or her fair sister were not ladies particularly well educated or highly bred all this he might have trusted to his mother wit to decide for him but he thought it worth while to discover if possible whether the military chef of the party had or had not enjoyed the reputation of being an honest man it required no very difficult manoeuvring to induce the grateful louisa to walk out upon the convenient terrace with him even though the doing so involved the necessity of an evident and obvious tete-a-tete -tete between them under the shelter as usual of a blooming orange tree how do you like this warm climate miss perkins he began i think you seem to suffer from it less than most of us it does not make me ill at all mr egerton she replied but i suppose all english people would like a little more cool air if they could get it undoubtedly have your friends the barnabys been used to such a climate as this before i rather suppose not from their appearing so greatly oppressed by it upon my word that is more than i am able to say returned miss louisa for notwithstanding we have got so very intimate we have not known them long indeed i rather imagined you were related said egerton not at all sir not the least in the world she replied then you must think them very amiable people miss perkins to set off on so long an expedition with them he observed miss louisa was rather at a loss how to reply to this observation for in fact it was during but a short portion of their not long acquaintance that she had been beguiled by her good nature into thinking any one of them amiable at all yet though she hesitated about saying this in so many words she had quite tact enough to feel that this good kind young gentleman whom she had made up her mind to be certain was violently in love with her young friend and ally annie beauchamp was not at all likely to admire or approve the ways and manners of the barnaby race more than she did herself and it was more from esteem for him than any love of gossip and less still of any unkind feeling that she answered i don't know about that mr egerton my sister matilda thought she should like to see something of this country and its ways which she thought likely i believe to be greatly different from ours and that it was that brought us across the sea that was very sisterly and good-natured on your part miss louisa he replied but do you not think it was rather a dangerous experiment for two single ladies to put themselves under the protection of a gentleman whom they knew so little of you must forgive my speaking so freely miss perkins on the score of my being a countryman indeed sir it needs no excuse on the contrary i take it exceedingly kind of you and i won't deny but what i think your remark seems a very just one to be sure we seem to be very comfortable just now because all the american ladies and gentlemen seem inclined to be so civil to us on account of mrs o i mean mrs allen barnaby's writing a book about them what name was it miss louisa that you were going to give her said egerton 
something beginning with an o though miss louisa perkins had been certainly desired not to refer in any way to the former appellation of the major it did not occur to her as possible that mr egerton should take any unfair advantage of him on account of his having changed his name and she therefore replied with perfect frankness i was going to say the name o'donagough sir they used to call themselves o'donagough when we first knew them which is now rather better than a year ago o'donagough repeated egerton musingly is it an irish name i don't know anything about that mr egerton she replied we made acquaintance with them at brighton where as i dare say you know sir a great many strangers are always coming and going without knowing very much about one another but this i must say for major and mrs o'donagough and their daughter miss patty as she then was that we saw them in the very best of society indeed they were very nearly related to some of the highest company there perhaps you may have heard of general hubert sir he seemed to be a gentleman very well known by all the higher sort of people general hubert repeated egerton with a stare of great astonishment these barnabys as they now call themselves related to general hubert i cannot help thinking that you are mistaken about that miss louisa i do not think it likely that general hubert should be related to these to this family that you are with i don't think it does seem very likely sir myself replied miss louisa very ingenuously but yet i do assure you it is quite true for i was in their company myself and my sister matilda with me when general hubert and mrs hubert and young mr hubert the son and old mrs compton mrs hubert's aunt all came to drink tea and pass the evening with major and mrs o'donagough as they were called then at brighton and my sister matilda made the tea so you see sir that i could not very well be mistaken tis very strange said egerton looking almost as much mystified as the danish prince himself when using the same words but certainly miss perkins he added after a few moments consideration i do not see how it is possible you could be mistaken about it oh no sir you may quite take my word for it that i am not at all mistaken about this relationship and what's more continued miss louisa with natural eagerness to convince her companion that she was making no blunder in her statement what's more mr egerton i have been at a party in their house in curzon street in london when not only general hubert and his lady and daughter were there too but ever so many more ladies and gentlemen also who were i believe related to the general or his lady a mr and mrs stephenson were some of them perhaps sir you may know the names of mr and mrs stephenson too certainly i do replied egerton his puzzle becoming greater as his belief strengthened as to the correctness of miss louisa's statement did the huberts and stephensons know these friends of yours by the name of barnaby as well as by that of o'donagough miss perkins reflected for a moment before she answered and then replied upon my word i don't know about that i don't much think they ever were called barnaby till they came away may i ask you miss perkins resumed the persevering egerton if you know the reason which induced the major to change his name this question seemed to awaken the simple-minded louisa to the impropriety she had been guilty of in so frankly stating to a perfect stranger a circumstance which she had been especially desired to conceal and she stammered blushed and faltered considerably before she determined how to reply to it but at length she said in an accent calculated to remove suspicion if anything could i believe mr egerton i have done what they would think very wrong in talking about it at all but though i must say the doing it at first was just thoughtless and nothing else yet your kindness sir in seeming to care a little about us because of our being english makes me feel as if i had done no more than right neither and this much i think i ought to say over and into the bargain and that is that mrs allen barnaby as we call her now did tell me and my sister matilda the whole history why it was that the major thought it best to change his name and that it was rather for his honour than the reverse and what many a gentleman i believe would be proud to tell of the name of general hubert however probably did more than this simple testimony of the worthy louisa's opinion on this point towards persuading mr egerton that he was mistaken as to the notion he had formed respecting the major's style of play nevertheless not even this could altogether remove a vague feeling of doubt upon the subject by no means indicative of very high personal esteem for his well-connected countrymen and it gave him satisfaction to think as he meditated upon the visit he was so unexpectedly engaged to make to colonel beauchamp that at least he should in some sort be able to repay his hospitality by giving a little attention to the game if it should happen that he and the military consort of the authoress should chance to play together during the time his own visit lasted 
End of chapters 23 and 24. Chapter 25 of The Barnabys in America by Francis Milton Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 the whole allen barnaby party set off with their new friend for big gang bank the seat of colonel beauchamp their reception a young lady's boudoir all preliminaries being thus far settled mrs allen barnaby very gracefully gave mrs colonel beauchamp to understand that her anxiety to find herself at big gang bank would admit of no further delay her notes having in fact exactly reached the point at which the sight of that magnificent piece of social machinery an actively organized slave plantation as judge johnson had elegantly described it in congress was become absolutely necessary this was quite enough to set the active mind and body of mrs beauchamp into such a state of excitement as very speedily brought all preparations depending on her to a conclusion and even the soporific colonel himself was sufficiently awakened by the intelligence to make him on hearing it pronounce in a very decided tone my dear the sooner we set off the better but the most remarkable phenomenon produced by these new arrangements was the manner in which they were received by annie for though disappointed in her hopes of an expedition up the mississippi and doomed moreover to endure at her own home the presence of the whole barnaby plus tornorino party in the oppressive character of guests it did not appear to vex her at all it was indeed quite astonishing to see how well she bore it the business of departure therefore was both rapidly and smoothly brought to a conclusion mrs carmichael wheezed forth her hopes of seeing them all again and patty's elegant and pious friend mrs general gregory declared that nothing should prevent her forthwith repairing to their plantation mansion in order to receive the whole party on their leaving big gang bank the journey produced no events particularly interesting which might partly be owing to the lassitude produced by the heat of the weather for though it was certainly a great relief to quit the glare of new orleans for scenes in which they had trees instead of houses to look at the exertion of travelling equalized the matter and the europeans of the party had little energy for anything beyond fanning themselves and sipping iced lemonade from stage to stage as they proceeded at length however this unavoidable martyrdom was over the melting journey at an end and all the luxuries of a rich planter's establishment around them in point of picturesque beauty big gang bank had little to boast of being a wide-spreading brick edifice situated in a large square enclosure of coarse ill-kept grass surrounded by a zigzag fence and with nothing in sight but a considerable expanse of flat country covered with sugar-canes cotton bushes and rice grounds diversified at intervals by clusters of negro huts the mansion itself consisted of a lofty centre and two low wings the former surmounted by a sort of pointed pediment in the middle of which yawned a huge round aperture containing the enormous dinner-bell the wings which had no second story displayed a row of at least a dozen windows in each and not only along this lengthy front but round the whole building ran a deep portico which being lined with orange trees and pomegranates redeemed it in some degree from the scorched-up aspect produced by the ill-complexioned material of the building and the defective verdure of the lawn which surrounded it but it was not on the expanse of her mansion or on the beauty of the flowering shrubs which adorned it that mrs beauchamp chiefly prided herself though well aware that it was all very first-rate elegant but her eyes sparkled as the carriages containing her numerous guests drove up to the portico and she perceived the centre door that was thrown open to receive them crowded with gaily clad negroes about a dozen of these male and female ran forward as the equipages approached ready to perform all offices necessary and unnecessary that might be required of them their light summer garb more picturesque than abundant was for the most part white perfectly clean and set off to great advantage by the mixture of bright-coloured calico introduced into their girdles and turban-like headgear you did not look i expect for such an elegant gang of domestic niggers in any private gentleman's dwelling did you my dear lady said the smiling mrs beauchamp addressing her most important guest but these are not the one half of the household gang and not any single one of them have any more to do with the canes or the cotton or the rice than you have it is indeed a most splendid establishment replied mrs allen barnaby raising her hand as in admiration it is a great loss as to labour in course resumed mrs beauchamp but my colonel is a very liberal high-minded gentleman and chooses that his wife and his daughter should live in all luxury according as they have a right to do doubtless dear lady she continued with a pitying shake of the head 
you have heard and read enough about the want of helps among the american ladies and it serves them right too there is no denying it for thinking of such a thing as turning a free-born american into a drudge to come and go at anybody's bidding true it is no doubt of it and very fitting too that they should want helps but now mrs allen barnaby ma'am i flatter myself you will have an opportunity of making your own observations and finding out for yourself the alone reason why so many of the finest ladies in the world are often forced to do their own dirty work and will be able to do justice to the real gentility of those who know better what is due to themselves walk in dear ladies walk in and pray remember that you may all of you just ring and call as much as you like indeed you'll only have to clap your hands ladies in order to bring as many domestic blacks about you as you can want or wish for pray make no scruples and don't fear that you are taking them from outdoor work for they are never sent into the grounds from year's end to year's ends except just for punishment and then they get their flogging in the fields which is a deal better you know than having it to do in the house this speech which was begun as they left the carriage lasted the whole length of an enormous hall which traversed the building from front to back affording by its perfect shade and the current of air which passed through it a very agreeable contrast to the heat which the travellers had been enduring oh goodness what a delightful place exclaimed madame tornorino i hope ma'am you mean to sit down here a little this is beautiful to be sure chimed in the greatly comforted matilda beginning to fan herself anew with refreshed strength and violence beautiful repeated mrs allen barnaby in an accent that seemed to scorn the insufficient epithet it is noble it is magnificent mrs beauchamp with patriotic and domestic pride both busy at her heart looked round upon the admiring guests as if she could have kissed them all oh my she gaily exclaimed you mustn't talk about this being beautiful it is just large and lofty and fresh that's all but you my dear mrs allen barnaby have taught your own clear-sighted way of seeing everything to your whole party and i'm sure it's a glory and a pleasure to show you anything but now please to walk in here ladies this is what we call number one because it is our littlest drawing-room but that's the proper way to begin you know we ought always to begin with the beginning and so i always bring new visitors in here first now do please to sit down all of you and refresh yourselves major allen barnaby and monsieur must be so kind i expect to excuse pa's stealing off so it has always been his way gentlemen and we mustn't look for his changing it now if it's twenty times in a year that he goes from home the first thing he does upon coming back to it is to go into a little dark room of his own picking and choosing and then he lights a cigar and gets a nigger or two to bring him a mint julep with a nice bit of ice in it and then gentlemen he sends off for his confidential looker who presently puts him up to everything that has happened on the estate since he went and i don't believe he'd lay down in his bed till he had heard all this if it was ever so the major and his son-in-law hastened to assure their amiable hostess that they should be immeasurably sorry if their being at big gang bank should in any degree interfere with the habits of colonel beauchamp all of which having been said with the most perfect politeness on all sides the whole party sat down on the various couches and sofas that seemed to invite them and then mrs colonel beauchamp clapped her hands upon this two handsome negro girls made their appearance side by side at the door and with a movement so similar and simultaneous that they rather looked like one piece of machinery than two self-moving human beings sangaree whisky melons ice and cakes said mrs beauchamp in a voice of authority that sounded a little like a word of command given on parade and ere the eye could wink the two figures became invisible and this is the country exclaimed mrs allen barnaby with emotion which the audacity of english travellers has dared to libel as inferior to their own i blush to think that i am an englishwoman never mind that dearest mrs allen barnaby replied her amiable hostess in a tone of the most friendly spirit of consolation that is a sort of misfortune you know that nobody can help let them wish it ever so much but this i will say that if ever a lady deserved to be a free-born american female it is you yourself dear kind mrs beauchamp returned the travelling lady how sweet it is to hear you say so 
i would not exchange such praise as those words contain for the richest diadem that ever encircled the tyrannical head of a european monarch mrs allen barnaby uttering these words appeared to be overpowered by her feelings and drew forth her pocket-handkerchief to catch the drops that emotion forced to flow fortunately the black automatons reappeared at this moment each bearing a tray the twin of which was in the hands of the other those who have never partaken of ice sangaree when the thermometer stands at a hundred cannot be trusted to calculate its power of soothing the spirits mrs allen barnaby tasted and was revived drank freely for it is a mixture that like copper's tea cheers but not inebriates and was herself again gay animated inspired and eloquent well now said mrs beauchamp looking cheerfully round her i do think we shall be as pleasant a party as ever was got together i wonder what has become of the young english gentleman mr egerton i heard him say positively that he would be here to-day and unless he has right down lost himself some way or another i expect he ought to be here by this time for i calculate he must have come to the same point by steam as we did only setting off by the next turn what's that annie she continued looking out of the window as conveniently as she could without approaching it is not that a gentleman on horseback i don't know mamma said the young lady suddenly passing through a pair of folding doors into an inner room i grieve that she should so have said because next to mrs allen barnaby herself annie beauchamp is the heroine of the present narrative and as the words thus uttered were not true i feel compelled to acknowledge that she does not altogether deserve the dignified position in which my partiality has induced me to place her annie beauchamp said that she did not know whether the approaching figure were that of a gentleman on horseback whereas she did know perfectly well not only that it was a gentleman on horseback but that moreover the gentleman was frederick egerton whatever might have been the motive for such falsification it was of course indefensible and i must leave her to the mercy of those to whom i have been compelled by my love of historic truth to make this disclosure a few minutes more and the fact became evident to all and mrs beauchamp prepared herself again to do the honours of her mansion her sangaree and her slaves in such a manner as to elevate her country in the eyes of another european to the highest pitch that it was possible for her to reach the young man paid his compliments to the circle assembled with his usual graceful ease although it did not appear to consist exactly of the party he expected to find there perhaps he was disappointed because colonel beauchamp was not himself present to welcome him neither the colonel nor his daughter however made their appearance till the hour of dinner the former being engaged exactly in the manner his lady had described and the latter choosing for some reason or other to pass the interval in her own room it was really a pretty room that allotted to the heiress of big gang bank for it was decorated according to her own fancy it was on the ground floor at the north-east corner of one of the wings and opened by two large french windows upon a very small but bright and fragrant flower-garden enclosed for and kept sacred to her own especial use and benefit and here all annie's private hours were passed and all her private studies carried on and considering that she did not deal in necromancy or any other branch of the art usually denominated black a very remarkable degree of mystery attended the prosecution of these studies annie beauchamp had for the last year of her life been very busily engaged in educating herself having with a good deal of acuteness discovered that during the time others had been engaged in teaching her she had learnt nothing but in order to perform this double part of tutor and pupil it was absolutely necessary that she should not be watched for as everybody excepting herself considered her education not only completed but completed on the most liberal and extended scale her own exertions would have been treated as a work of supererogation which it would be quite as well to leave alone moreover this self-education was carried on in a style that would indisputably have brought upon her as many reproofs for neglecting her studies in one line as for prosecuting them unnecessarily in another annie had caused her adoring parents a vast number of quarters in all the most approved branches of american female accomplishments to no single one of which she had devoted an hour since she left college algebra and mathematics she wholly neglected her plain trigonometry she tore into fragments and made her own little slave nina sweep it all away astronomy fared not much better and all the elements of all the ologies were crammed into a basket together and carried off in company with the trigonometry from both music and painting which had of course been quartered upon her as long as she remained in other hands than her own she also turned resolutely away not in distaste but in despair 
in short annie beauchamp did nothing but read and that she did with an avidity and perseverance for which nothing but her unlimited credit with a new york bookseller could have supplied materials to the scene of all this quiet study the eccentric little girl now repaired but instead of taking a book she placed herself at the greatest possible distance from her reading corner and seating herself in a low chair with her fairy feet upon a somewhat high footstool her crossed arms resting on her lap and her absent eyes fixed upon the floor she would have made as pretty a study for the attitude commonly described by the words nose and knees as ever was seen ere she had indulged many minutes in this half sulky half happy position which at that moment was particularly well suited to her state of mind her enjoyment of it was disturbed by the entrance of nina this nina was a negro girl exactly of her own age who had been commanded to play with her in infancy and elected to the especial honour of being the young harris's personal attendant from the time of her return from school she was not suffered however to leave the plantation when her young mistress went from home because as the confidential manager of the household gang informed his master she was so darnation cute that she'd be sure to bring home mischief if she did the black and white girls therefore had been separated for two months and despite the tremendous interval between the heiress and the slave the pleasure of meeting was mutual though perhaps not quite equal in degree annie had many things to think about nina had but one and that one was her young mistress the black girl entered through the open window with the light spring of an antelope and dropping upon her knees before annie's footstool seized first upon one delicate hand and then upon the other to kiss and fondle them while she exclaimed in english as pure as that spoken by her well-read young mistress it is like shade in the midst of the rice ground what is like shade nina said annie smiling kindly on her the girl sighed deeply and did not answer what is like shade nina repeated her mistress the sight of something very dear and long unseen replied the girl but it is not like the shade of the free forest she continued looking up to the face of annie with an expression of great suffering what is the matter with you nina said the young lady looking with much surprise at the troubled countenance of her pretty slave do you mean to say that you want me to give you your freedom ma freedom do you think miss annie that it is possible i could ever wish to be free whilst i belong to you oh do not think it such a wish never crossed my mind for a single instant since i have been old enough to know what wishing meant then what do you mean my dear girl and what does that tear mean nina why do you look upon me so very sadly i never saw you in this humour before said annie looking earnestly at the dark face that rested on her knees how should i be able to tell you replied the girl evasively even you miss annie sometimes seem hardly to know what is passing in your own mind and do you wonder that with all my ignorance i should not know more than you do what have you been reading nina since i went away demanded annie looking grave i think you have been wasting your time with some of those foolish novels foolish for you they certainly are for they cannot by possibility convey to you a single useful idea i have not but never mind now dearest miss annie about my reading it matters little what a negro girl reads so that she leave not her work undone but why do you look so sad nina you have not told me that you know said her young mistress looking curiously in the large eyes that had not yet been able to wink away their superfluous moisture why are your eyes full of tears my poor girl why the truth is miss annie said the young slave i am sorry you are come home though i love to see you i was so glad when i heard you were going to be very happy and to travel about and that is the reason you know why i may be sorry you are come home again so soon i should scarcely have thought you would have cried about it either said annie looking puzzled for a moment but you were always an odd girl nina though a good one too as times go but there go now i can't talk to you any longer for i am thinking of something else you may go into my bedroom nina and unpack all my things and bring all the books you find into this room there go at first hearing the word go the girl had sprung upon her feet but even after hearing it a second time she still lingered i will go she said but without moving what ails you nina said annie laughing i think you are bewitched why do you not go where i bid you what a spoilt girl you are nina tell me now naughty blackie 
ought i not to send you to the rice-ground if you did miss annie she replied shaking her head perhaps i should go more quickly she now moved a step or two towards the door but before she reached it turned round and said will you not go miss annie and pay a visit to the good lady at portico lodge to be sure i shall go and pay a visit to the good lady at portico lodge replied annie did you ever know me neglect my kind old friend but you do not want me to go this very minute nina do you again the young slave stood silent for a while before she answered and looked irresolute and embarrassed as if she had something on her mind that she wished to express but for some reason or other did not choose to utter it what are you dreaming about nina said annie laughing i do believe girl that you are in love nina shook her head sighing however at the same time so very deeply that her mistress laughed again saying nay then it is so is it my pretty blacky well nina i hope the beloved loves again and there is no great doubt of that seeing that you are acknowledged on all hands you know to be the beauty of the whole plantation but he must be a very nice fellow nina or i shall not give my consent oh ma miss annie returned the girl tears again starting in her eyes i wish you would not talk so idly go and see good madam whitlaw as soon as ever you can she is a kind lady and she loves you dearly miss annie and besides she knows everything and everybody and will be likely if any one can to here nina suddenly stopped short rapidly turning her eyes away as if to avoid meeting those of her mistress which were fixed upon her if you are not in love nina you are most certainly gone or going out of your wits said miss beauchamp waving her off and if you don't go away directly it is very likely that i shall lose mine for all you do say is as unintelligible as all you do not say besides nina i tell you i am thinking of something else once again the black girl heaved a very heavy sigh and then retreated leaving her mistress less disposed to meditate upon her mystery and her melancholy than she probably would have been had she not been as she said thinking of something else End of chapter twenty five